Hello, friends. So this is going to be a class on CMA part two topic, liquidity ratios. Basically, we'll be talking about liquidity ratios. But first, let me tell you a background about the CMA exam. The CMA exam has got a depth, not a depth, I would say a width of every topic in finance. It would cover everything, almost everything, so that you'll be familiar with all, uh, all the uh, all the knowledge what you need to know in finance. Of course, it's an ocean. You will, you will not know 100%, but you would touch upon almost everything. So that in your organization, when, uh, when somebody says any term or uh, any financial jargon, you would not be unfamiliar with it. You would know something about it. Of course, there are certain items we wouldn't be going into a great depth. Like, for example, in accounting, we wouldn't go into business combinations, etc., in, in a very large depth like the CPA. But it would give you sufficient knowledge for you to understand everything and to contribute to the organization. Right? The CMA exam is tough. The part two results would is of course better than part one. I don't know, strangely, I, I couldn't figure out why, but the part two results show slightly better than part one. It's almost 50%, but it's getting tougher by the day. As you know, the CMA exam uh, is of four hours, three hours multiple choice questions and one hour for an essay. The multiple choice questions do not have negative markings, right? So if you get a question wrong, there's not, there are no negative marks for that. Your marks would not get reduced. So what's the secret here? The secret here is to attempt each and every question. Answer it. Even if you don't know the correct answer, guess something, flag it. And then later, when you have the time, because time management is very important, when you have the time, those flag questions would come back to you, and then you can sit and try to figure out the correct answer, right? And then, of course, if you get sufficient number of questions correct in the MCQs, you will be allowed into the essay. Essay is one hour. You do not need any special preparations for essay, if you ask me. When you're studying the multiple choice questions, it's just an extension of the multiple choice questions, right? You are to be describing those very questions which you got in your multiple choices. But here, of course, you cannot guess the answer. You have to know definite answers. And yes, you would actually be uh, doing everything uh, and uh, describing the answers. So you shouldn't take too long to describe your answers. You should be putting sort of one-liners so that you have time to answer all the essay questions. Always, always uh, do your essays or practice your essay questions on your computer because there is no, uh, you know, the thought flow would come to you when you practice on your computer. You would not be writing or with your pencil and paper, uh, paper, right? So do not practice on paper. When you're pra practicing essays, always practice on the computer so that the thought flow comes automatically, right? So that's what you have to understand. And uh, what I always tell my students that, see, suppose in the exam, there is, let us say, one minute. Imagine your position like this, it could happen because many students face this challenge. There's one minute to go, and there are 10 MCQs to answer. Now, if you're going to read, even read an MCQ, your time will be up. So in such a situ situation, what do you do? Just put some answer for everything. Don't even read it. Just put A, 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 or B, 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 as, it like, as you like. See, out of 10 questions, What's the probability? Actually, the probability is one out of four, is it not? So there's a good chance that you will get 25% correct of these 10 questions. Even if you are blindly put AA 
or B, 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 etc. without even reading the question, right? So there's a good chance you'll get, okay, by probability theory, 2.5 questions. You cannot get 2.5 questions correct. So, okay, let us say three questions correct. There's a good chance of you getting three questions correct. Or if you're very unlucky, you might get one question correct. But I very much doubt that you would get none of it correct. So this you have to do only if you're if you're trapped, you have no other option. You have one minute and 10 questions. So the, the main point, what I want to emphasize here is, please attempt all your questions. Okay, do not leave any question unanswered. So that is my first and foremost tip for you to pass the exam. Do a very good preparation. This is not an exam. This is not an exam where you can memorize and try to pass it. No, that might be for your graduation. The Indian graduation programs is generally rote learning and you can just memorize formulas and stuff, you know, and then try to uh, pass the exams. Not with the CMA and professional exam. They see to it that you, you cannot fit anything into a formula. They would twist and turn the questions in such a way. Every question has a catch in it. It's not straightforward. So they would twist and turn it. I mean, they would actually uh, twist it in such a way that you would not even understand the question. So it's very important that you would, uh, if at all you're looking at formulas, you have to understand the formulas. Now, my method of teaching is totally uh, by to make you understand everything, right? It's to make you understand each and every uh, concept of it. I don't go by formulas. Okay? I won't be going by formula. Even I'll be teaching you by logic, but unconsciously we would be following the formula. But main thing is try to understand the thing. Even if you put a formula down, try to understand the formula very well. And other thing, what I would emphasize here, I'm not only looking at you to pass the exam. I just don't want you to just pass the exam, no. The real test comes when you go for the interviews where they test you on the concepts. That is where you would bag your jobs. Just by no examiner, no interviewer, is interested in a piece of paper that's your certificates they are they're interested is in what you have here in your minds what's the knowledge you have gained and how you can help the organization that is what they are looking for so you have to understand each and every concept and not only after passing the exam you should keep in touch with the subject through journals through newspapers anything related to finance you should be reading understanding you would understand and enjoy it better once you have studied the CMA, believe me. That's what happened to me also. Everything what I read about finance, I'm understanding. The same thing would happen to you. You would understand each and every topic you're reading. Right? And it would make, make it so much more enjoyable. And you would be contributing to the organization and strengthening your knowledge. So ultimately, your focus should be to gain knowledge and skills, not to pass. Passing would come automatically once you have mastered this, right? So that the focus should be knowledge. So passing, don't worry about it. Once you pass and even after you pass, you would have the knowledge. So that's going to be my approach basically. So you would find me not looking at the text so much, but to uh, you know, try to make you understand. And you are free to have uh, an interaction with me. You can ask me doubts and I would be answering. So now I have selected in part two, section A, I said I've uh, chosen to sp speak about liquidity ratios. Of course, later on, we will be speaking about solvency also, but for the moment, it is liquidity ratios. Part two, section A is 20% weightage in your exam. And it's very easy to score. 
But again, they would test you your concepts, not just formulas. Okay. So now, first of all, try to understand what is liquidity. And what's the difference between liquidity and solvency? There are two different things. Is it the same thing? Now, let me just give you an example. You have a house. You own this house. You are sitting here. Okay. Pardon my drawing. You're sitting here. You're counting a lot of cash piled up here. I'll put dollar signs there. Yeah, so there you have cash here. Now, this cash would help you if you do not own a house, it will help you pay the rent. But I told you, you own the house here. It would help you with your food. You want to go and have a haircut. Yes, it would help you. Right? So if you have you owe somebody something, you want to pay your ration bill, which you had kept accumulating on credit. So you can pay that also with this amount of cash, which you have piled up here. Now, this cash is liquidity. It enables you to buy or to or with your day-to-day -day expenses. And it helps you to pay your current liabilities, the electricity bill, for example, which is accumulated over the month. It helps you pay that with this cash. Then what is the difference between liquidity and solvency? Now, if you did not have this cash, let me just erase that cash out for the time being. If you don't have this cash, okay, oops, I'm sorry about that. The house also vanished. Okay, so yeah. So if you don't have the cash, how are you going? to pay for your food, for your haircut, the electricity bill, etc. You don't have liquidity here now. But does that mean that you cannot pay it? You can pay. You can still have your food, haircut, etc. But you may have to sell your house. When you have to sell your house for basic things like day-to-day -day expenses and current liabilities, you have no liquidity, but you are still solvent. If you didn't have the house as well as if you don't have cash, you're homeless. You're fully bankrupt. Now, still, you're not bankrupt. Probably, you can think of renting out a portion of your house or even selling off a portion of your house, right, to get some liquidity. But here, you're still solvent, but not liquid. So I, understand, I suppose with this simple example, you understand what is liquidity and solvency. So for the moment, we are going to study about liquidity. What are the different liquidity ratios we can use to gauge the liquidity position of an organization? Okay, how can we do that? There are various ones. One is the current ratio. Now here again, you don't have to memorize too many things here. The, the name of the ratio itself tells you about what the ratio means. So current ratio is nothing but current assets, everything current, current assets divided by current liabilities. Putting a short form there, current liabilities. Current assets divided by current liabilities. Now what are current, whichever, can get converted into those cash, which I told you about. Within a year, within a year or operating cycle, which is a, whichever is longer. Let me just keep it at, which can be converted within a year, okay? What does it comprise of? Cash itself, and then accounts receivable, then 
marketable securities. What are marketable securities which can be converted into cash or its equivalents within a short period of time? Okay, so marketable securities and inventory prepaid expenses all these are current current assets divided by current liabilities which would be your accounts payable whichever has to be paid within a year okay all the accruals which is accumulated right accruals which has to be paid off within the year and current portion of long term liability that which has to paid be be paid within a year current portion of a long term debt and various other things, any other thing like tax payable, for example, anything which has to be paid within a year. So are these sufficient to pay off these liabilities? So that would gauge your liquidity position. Say, suppose if it is two is to one, there's no norm for it. It depends on the industry. Suppose there's two is to one. That is, you have twice the current assets, uh, twice the uh, current assets, compared to your liabilities, you can say that the liquidity position is good, depending on the industry again. Right? So this is what it would mean. Okay? So this is what it would mean. Okay, now, what are the other ratios? Fine. The other ratios could be, uh, let me just close this and open one more. Yes. The other ratios are quick ratio. The quick ratio, for example, would be the assets, quick assets, divided by the same current liabilities. I'll put it as CL. For all the ratios, the, the current liabilities is the same. Only the numerator changes for all the liquidity ratios. Now, what are the quick ratios? Like the name suggests, which gets quickly converted into cash more quicker than the current ratio items. So cash itself would be there, marketable securities, marketable securities, accounts receivable. Why are we including accounts receivable here? Because it's one step away from cash. It's not cash at the moment, it will be soon can be converted to cash. That's why the word quick. No inventory, no prepaid items because they are not so quick. Inventory, for example, has to become accounts receivable if you are selling on credit and then it becomes cash. So this divided by the same current liabilities. This is more, uh, what you would say, more conservative. It will give you a lower number than the current ratios because the current ratio has more in the numer numerator. You're including more items in the numerator than the quick ratio. So this is one more measure of measuring liquidity. And these ratios are very much used in real life. For example, if you take a bank loan, if your company takes a bank loan, I have had the experience when our company took a bank loan, the bank requires us to project, not only work out the these ratios for the current period, but also to project it for future months and future uh, and for the complete year, at least a year, they require a forecast. Okay. A more stringent ratio would be the cash ratio, wherein we would knock out the accounts receivable. Like the word suggests, only the cash, the marketable securities, no accounts receivable. This not there. Okay. 
divided by the same current liabilities. This would give you an even lower number, but it would give you a sure way that you can be very much more sure about you about uh, uh, meeting your liabilities with this ratio. Because cash is already with you, you don't have to depend on anybody. Marketable security is already there. You can sell it uh, in the short run without significant loss of market value. So this is a more better ratio or a more conservative ratio to check your liquidity position. Accounts receivable um, has a little bit of uncertainty in it, right? There, are, there might be, of course, you have to provide for allowance for bad debts and put the net accounts receivable here, which you're sure of collecting, but still there's an element of surprise or some element of uncertainty whether you'll be able to collect it. So cash ratio is more, makes you more sure about whether you can clear your current liabilities or not. Now, let me tell you something which is generally not in the CMA text. Defensive interval ratio. Now, suppose you don't have current liabilities. There's a chance that you do not have current liabilities, right? The firm doesn't owe anything to anybody. Or even you can work out this ratio for yourself. You don't owe anybody anything, let us say. But let us say that, just God forbid, but let us say that you lost your job. So what is your defensive interval ratio? You can put those items like cash or marketable securities or whatever you want, whatever you have in the numerator and divide it by your daily ex expenses. Per day expenses, you can see. And by this, you can get, like suppose, suppose you have, let us say, 1,000 cash. I'm just giving an example. 1,000 cash, and you have got, uh, uh, let us say, expenses of $50 every day. Okay, you don't owe anybody anything. Your house is your own. You have $50 expenses every day. You can manage for 20 days. So that is your defensive interval. That's, that's how long you can defend yourself, right? This is hardly tested in the CMA exam, but this is something to be noted in, as I told you, when you go for a job or anything like that, when you may have to use this. It's a common sense thing that even you would be, you and you and I will be using it in case we lose our job and we have a load of cash with us. We want to see how long that cash would last us before we can get another job. So how, many, how long can we defend ourselves? So that's the defensive interval ratio. Highly tested, but good to know. Right. Having spoken about these liquidity ratios, do are we going to be tested on it? Like, are they going to ask us in the uh, exam, in the multiple choice questions, like how to compute the liquidity ratio? Like how, how would you, or calculate the current ratio or the quick ratio, the cash ratio. No, they don't ask you straightforward questions like that. What is the favorite of the CMA exam is the sensitivity of these ratios. If a transaction happens, will a current ratio or quick ratio increase or will it decrease with the transaction? As a management accountant, you need to be knowing that because you will have to advise the company whether they should go in and do that particular transaction, uh, especially during your ends and when you have to meet certain bank covenants. What are bank covenants? Certain clauses uh, put by the bank that you shouldn't be violating. Suppose they say that you need to have a current ratio one is to one. You should see that it doesn't deteriorate and become 0.8 is to one. Certain transactions would make the quick ratio or current ratio to deteriorate. Certain transactions would enhance the ratio. So we should be aware about the sensitivity, what the current ratio, quick ratio, or cash ratio is most sensitive to. Those are the questions that would be tested in the CMA exam. 
let us get on with it and start doing multiple choice questions. All this, this is, this is all the theory which you need to know. You can read the text for more information if you want to, but at this stage, you are fit enough to answer multiple choice questions once you have seen me working out certain multiple choice questions. So let's get on with it. Let me share the screen. This is some of the questions which I have chosen for this demo session. A company has current assets of 400,000, current liabilities of 500,000. Which of the transaction would make the current ratio increase? This is the question. Okay, now let us analyze what's the current ratio. I'm going to truncate the zeros. I'm just going to put 400 by 500. I can even put four by five, but I'll put 400 by 500. That is 400 by 500 is 0.8 is to one. This is the current ratio. What would make it increase? Let us check option A. Purchase of inventory on account. What do you mean by on account? On credit. So what will be the entry? Always remember one thing. As finance professionals, you should know accounting like the back of your hand. You should be very familiar with accounting. Right? There is no finance, finance professional who would say that I don't know accounting. I don't know that the basic debits and credits and journal entries. You should know everything from the general journal, journal entries, to posting of the ledgers, to preparing trial balance, making adjusting entries, and to prepare the financial statements, that is income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flows, statement of changes of equity, comprehensive income statement, etc., etc. You should know everything, right? And only then you can claim to be an expert in analyzing them. So now, what would be the entry for this? It would be debit inventory. And they've mentioned the amount also, it's 100,000. And credit accounts payable. Accounts payable, 100,000. So debiting inventory would increase the numerator because in the current ratio, inventory is included. And crediting accounts payable would increase the denominator. So that would make it now, now 500 by 600. And did this increase the uh, current ratio? You can just check it out. 500 divided by 600 is 0.833 is to one. Yes, it has increased from 0.8 to 0.833. A is the right answer. Now, my question to you. So if your company is having a 0.8, uh, or if your company is having a certain current ratio, you would tell them to purchase inventory on account in order to increase the ratio. Am I right? No, not always. It depends on what was the current ratio in the first place. Now let us reverse the situation. Now, okay, we answered the question. I'm going to explain a little more for you to understand every part of it. Of course, you don't have to do all this for the exam, but when you're studying, you better listen to all of my explanation in order to get a comprehensive understanding about the whole thing. Now, let us assume that the current ratio was 500 by 400, just the reverse. Here it is 400 by 500. Now we are assuming that the current assets is 500 and current liability is 400. That would give us 1.25 is to one. Now if, we, now if we purchase inventory on account, will it increase the current ratio? The answer is no, just try it. It would increase the numerator like before because inventory is added to the current ratio. 
in the numerator and then it will become 600 and this would become 500. Now, what is the ratio? Six divided by five, that is now 1.2. Now just note, here it increased. Now here it is decreasing. Why? Why is this happening? It depends on the proportion of the amount you are adding in the numerator and the denominator. In here, for example, you're adding 100 over what was there, 400. So you're adding a 25% to the numerator. And how much you're adding to the denominator? 100, 100 over a total of 500. That's what you're adding in the denominator. That is, you're adding 20% in the denominator. You're adding a higher percentage in the numerator and a lower percentage in the denominator. Since you're adding more percentage in the numerator, the ratio increases. Whereas here, there's a 20% increase in the numerator and a 25% increase in the denominator, 100 over 400. Since the denominator is increasing more, the ratio drops. That is the science behind the whole thing. So you should always know why things are happening. That would contribute to your understanding of ratio sensitivity. Okay, so A is the right answer. Okay, now let us look at the wrong answers and see why they are wrong. A collection of 100,000 of accounts receivable. What does it do? What's the entry for this? Debit, cash, credit, accounts receivable. 100, 100. So what happens in the current ratio? The current ratio is made up of cash, accounts receivable, inventory, etc. divided by current liabilities. Now, in this, when it happens, cash is going up by 100, accounts receivable is going down by 100 because accounts receivable paid it, you're crediting it. So there wouldn't be any change. Here there is a minus, here there is a plus. There wouldn't be change in the current asset situation at all. The current ratio would not change with this transaction. Okay, the current ratio would not change with this transaction. Now, is the answer do not forget. Now, payment of accounts payable. What would happen? Payment of accounts payable of 100,000. Right? So let us try that out. 400 by 500 to start off with. It had a current ratio of 0.8 is to 1. Payment of 100,000 accounts payable would be debit accounts payable. Liability is getting reduced and credit cash, cash is going out. So this would become 300 because cash is going out, 100,000 cash is going out. So from 400, it will become 300 and 500 will become 400. It reduces the current ratio reduces. So will you advise your company that do not pay any accounts payable in the year end because the current ratio would reduce? The answer is again, no. Suppose if it is the other way about, 500 by 400, 500 current asset and 400 current liabilities. And as I showed you before, 1.25 is to one, the current ratio. If this, accounts payable payment happened, 500 will become 400 because cash is going out, 400 will become 300 because accounts payable is getting reduced. So now we have four divided by three, 1.33. It increased here. Here it increased, here it reduced. Why? Again, because of the same reason, right? The amount which gets uh, reduced here in the numerator is 100 divided by 400. 100 is getting reduced. So there's a 25% decrease in the numerator. 
and a 20% decrease in the denominator, 100 divided by 500, 20% is decreasing in the denominator. Since the numerator decreases by a higher percentage, the current ratio drops. Here is the other way about. There is a 20% decrease in the numerator, but a 25% decrease in the denominator. Since the denominator decreases by a higher percentage than the numerator, the denominator decreases, the ratio goes up. That is the science behind it. So please do not memorize that payment of accounts payable would always decrease the ratio. No, it can increase it as well as you saw here. Okay, now the last one. The last one. Don't forget again is the answer. Okay, refinancing a long-term debt with a short-term debt. What do you mean by this? What we mean by this is we are paying off a long-term debt by taking a short-term debt. So in other words, it would be in short, the entry would be debiting long-term debt. Okay. So debiting long-term debt, 100,000 and creating a short-term debt. So now you, the company has to pay this faster, right? They, they canceled out the long-term debt. And in place of that, they have taken the short term debt. Right? So you are actually, uh, what is happening? Increasing the current liabilities without corresponding increase in the current assets. So the current assets would be as it is. It was 400 by 500. What would happen? The 400 would remain the same, the 500 would become 600. And definitely the ratio is going down from 0.8 to, uh, to actually 0.66. It was down. So whenever only the denominator is increasing, definitely the ratio is going to go down. So A is the right answer. So this is how you should be answering these kind of questions. Now let us go on to the next sensitivity question. Just a minute. Okay, let's stop annotating, go down. Okay, well, I have to erase this first. I'll erase everything. And go to the next question. Now, this is a very easy question. It's a very easy question. It says that the company, the company uh, has quick assets more than the current liabilities. It is a profit-making company. Generally, profit-making companies have got current assets and quick assets more than the current liabilities because they are profit-making, so they would be receiving more money than they have to pay out. And he's saying that the collection of a current accounts receivable of 29,000 would affect which ratio the most? Would it decrease the current ratio and quick ratio? Would it increase the quick ratio? Would it increase the current ratio or not affect any of the ratios? Well, if you analyze this transaction, there will be a debit of cash of 29,000 and credit of accounts receivable 
of 29,000. So if you analyze the current ratio, the current assets would be, would be cash, accounts receivable, and inventories, right? And current divided by current libraries. And if you analyze the quick ratio, you do not have inventory, that's all. You would have cash, marketable securities, accounts receivable divided by current libraries. In both the cases, what would happen is cash is going up by 29 and accounts receivable is going down by 29. So here also cash is going up by 29, accounts receivable going down by 29. So the numerator doesn't change for both the current ratio and the quick ratio. So the numerator doesn't change. This movement within the numerator, items within the numerator, there's a movement. And current liability is no change in both the ratios. There would not be any effect on either the current ratios or the quick ratio. So D is the right answer. Right? So this is about this is how you should be answering. Uh, this is how you should be actually answering all the questions uh, where sensitivity is concerned. You have to analyze, you have to put down numbers. You have to put down numbers and analyze the effect it would have on the numerator and the denominator. And as you know very well, an increase in the numerator would increase the ratio but an increase in the denominator would decrease the ratio. So those kind of basics you would know actually. And this is how you should be solving some of it. Of course, once we get into the real classes, I would be showing you more questions, the difficult ones, always work out the difficult ones. And while you are learning, always analyze the wrong answers. You don't have to do it for every number question, but if it's a word kind of question, you need to be knowing why the wrong answers are wrong as well. That's very important to know because that wrong answer might be the right answer for the next question. Have a thorough understanding about the wrong answers and right answers. One more tip I should give you. Do as many multiple choice questions as possible. That would see you through the exam. And whenever you have a slight conceptual doubt, never go to the exam with the wrong concept. Always consult with either the faculty or look into the books, clarify that concept. I would suggest that you directly contact the faculty. Faculties are always pleased to uh, clarify your questions. There is no such thing as a silly question. Please bear that in mind because we have seen it all. We also had silly, silly questions when we were learning. Okay, so you are no exception. Nobody's stupid. Nobody would think that you're stupid. There's no stupid question. You can feel free to ask all your questions and we would clarify to you, clarify things to you. You would not only pass the exam, but also get through those tough interviews for jobs. Good luck, everybody. And I wish you all the best.